Hi everyone, welcome to Wheel of Mind, the Wheel of Time point of view reread podcast. This season we've been reading Matt Cawthon's perspective. Welcome to season two, episode 29, our first Matt episode in Knife of Dreams. I'm your co-host, Lajara Dane of the White Aja. Hi, and I'm Giskel Simmeris, a scholar from Ilian. Those of you familiar with our Wheel of Mind podcast know just how we roll, but for any new listeners, this is a reread podcast, and we may spoil any plot line of the series without further warning. So this is your spoiler warning. We recommend that you read the entire series before listening to this podcast. Now today we are examining chapters 6 and 7 from the book A Knife of Dreams. And I'll get us started with my summary of chapter 6, A Stave and a Razor. And I wrote this like two weeks ago. I have no idea what it says, so bear with me here. <laughs> Sorry. The morning after Rena's death, Matt is inside Luca's wagon while Latell prepares breakfast. Valen has decided to stay in the area a few more days. The residents are rich enough for repeat visits, and he's making a killing, remarking that he'd almost think he's Tavirin, what with how well things are just falling into his lap lately. Matt grumbles that the man wouldn't like it if he actually were Tavirin, but that just seems to confuse him. Matt proposes paying Luca to leave sooner, but... That would look too suspicious, wouldn't it? A traveling show that doesn't stop and put on shows? Latell lovingly starts to serve the food to Valen and makes it clear Matt isn't welcome to stay for the meal. Matt starts walking toward the town and trips twice along the way when he thinks of Rand. Those swirling colors interrupt his vision with intimate scenes of Rand and Min together. Oh, light. The guards looking on don't seem happy with a drunk stumbling into town this early in the morning, but his fine clothes seem to put them at ease, so they leave him alone. He was tempted to get a drink and roll some actual dice in his hands, but that was not his mission that morning. He bought a meat pie and did his best not to bump into any dual happy Altarans. He stopped at a weapons booth and found a stave of black yew. Could it be? The seller seemed to think it was a quarterstaff, but Matt knew it to be an Andorn-grown raw material for a two rivers of longbow, like the one he had to leave behind in Ebudar. The seller seemed shocked at how much he would pay for a stick, but Matt would have paid a lot more for it if the seller had been savvy to what she had. He left her confused. He also went to several stables to shop for horses, but didn't find what he was looking for until he found one next to the inn called the Twelve Salt Wells. It was kept clean, and best of all, contained a Domani Razor Mare, a nearly mythically good breed. He played dumb, calling it a piebald and bad luck as he haggled with the owner. He bargained hard and ended up paying less than half of the sticker price, if you will. Both he and the seller came away satisfied, seeming to think they had gotten one over on the other. He rode it back to the show, seeing a long line of people from all walks of life lined up to get in. He also noticed Eludra arranging to have something carted in on wagons, no doubt for her fireworks, but no idea what the material actually was or what she would do with a bell founder. He hid the razor among the horse lines and went to see Tuon. He burst into the purple-painted wagon without knocking, which got him admonishment from Tuon. For that, and for having grease on his coat. She, Noel, and Oliver were sitting down to a meal served by Seleucia. Matt had interrupted Noel telling a story. Somehow, Tuon had had a lovely red pleated dress made in the last day. She must have paid a lot of gold for it to have it rushed, Matt supposed. He accepts her criticism with a smile and addresses her as precious, which really seems to anger her. After signing some with Seleucia, she alludes to playing a new game with him, and he's utterly confused. Seleucia served him some dinner, and Noel continues his story about Sharon Ayod cities being full of women, but devoid of men over twenty. Matt butts in to ask whether Noel is kin to Jane Charon. Jane Forestrider, that is. Noel claims he's a cousin, and that Jane was a fool who went off on stupid adventures while he let his wife die. And he let himself be used as a tool. He stops there, and he does so a couple of times over dinner, rubbing his head and seeming confused or forgetful. Tuon is intrigued. Who is such a great man with two names that they speak of as if everybody should know? Oliver says he was great, and listed his feats, fighting Trollocs and Murdral, and capturing Cow and Gamalin, who betrayed Malkir to the Shadow. Noel allows that Jane did those feats, but again, at what cost? Tuon crossed the table and touched Noel's arm, saying, Quote, you have a good heart, Master Charon, end quote. Noel is flattered, but gets confused again. Suddenly, Julian bursts in to warn of Shan Chen's soldiers setting up across the road and dashes off to be with Thera. And thus ends Chapter 6, A Stave and a Razor. 
Okay, this is a transition chapter, if you would. We're starting to get back in some action. To me, the entire storyline with Matt and Tuan and the band being with Valen Lucas Traveling Show just bogs down to me. You know, I enjoy it. it. It's moving the story forward, but this is one of these things that should be happening much faster. So we're starting to see the acceleration now. It, it began last episode, if you would, of our podcast with the Suldam trying to escape and trying to warn people uh, or warn the Xian Chan. But here we see, you know, we see things continue to, to move forward, even though Oddly enough, both of these chapters six and seven were sitting still in the city of Girador. We're not we're not going anywhere, but the story mm-hmm. is going somewhere, and and or mm-hmm. you feel like it's it's moving, and picking up the pace a little bit, and I do like that. Yeah, we have some setup for some developments. In right. The plot. Thank you. Thank you. And and it seems like you see more things coming to fruition here. <laughs> I do like the interplay between Matt and Valen Luca concerning Taviran. Uh, because, mm-hmm. of course, obviously Luca does not know this. He doesn't understand that Matt is Taviran and a very powerful Taviran. Now, there are more powerful Taviran in the world right now, uh, and, and we kind of get some voyeurism going on there every time Matt thinks about Rain. <laughs> and, yeah. and that says something about who Matt is, too. I think as as a 16-year-old boy, you know, Matt would not have been you know, trying to catch a badger in a sack, he would have been thinking of Rand if, if you know, he could get in that situation back then and get those glimpses. <laughs> but but now Matt is a man that, you know, no, he's ooh, not interested in watching that. You know, Randland pornography is just not for him. That is, that's that's yeah. not, <laughs> not a spectator sport to Matt. He doesn't mind participating, but this is not a spectator sport. I mean, who knows? If it were anybody other than his friend... He might. Uh, <laughs> we don't know for sure. I don't know. He seems, he seems kind of just grossed out by the whole thing. You know? Yeah, I, I yeah, think, that's uh, true. I mean, but, it, you know, it's sort of like a, a close friend is almost like a family member oh, in yes, that regard. Yeah. So It does make it even that's worse. That's sort of how yes. I read it. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, the fact that he won't admit to being Taverin, you know, we're kind of back to, he, he admits <laughs> yeah. it to himself, but he's not going to admit it publicly to people oh, who yeah. don't already know. That That is, that idea is totally out. It's not going to happen. And and we get this, I, I guess to me, it, it's just comedy, but uh, it, it may be something deeper than that, where he he still plays it off as being terrible. Well, you wouldn't like it if you were Taverin, you know, and just confuses Valen completely. He doesn't. He doesn't understand. Matt still sees it as a negative in his life. Mm-hmm. It's almost as if to him, his luck is one thing and being <laughs> Taverian is another. He doesn't see that yeah. the, the luck is the, the Taverian nature changing the pattern in his favor right. when it needs to happen. And it's he like he not... still sees those as two separate things. Yep. He's not crediting these awesome finds he got in town to his Tavirinness. Right. It, it's right. getting stronger, I think, than he realizes and what he's used to. I mean, he found this Andoran black U and this Domani razor horse both in the same town in the same day. And both of these items really had no business being all the way out here in Altara. Right. And he gets a good deal on both of them. So, I mean, part of the good deal could be his own negotiation skills, but there's got to be some of that luck in there sometimes. So it appears that he's pulling objects toward him from a across the continent um <laughs> yes. it's not just a matter of being in the right place at the right time like he sometimes is and i don't think he fully understands how that's helping him right now oh, absolutely yeah he he just doesn't doesn't see that as being being the pattern changing around him he's he's just mad he's not going to see what he doesn't want to see i do like tuan's little game and mm-hmm. and matt Matt started it here by calling her precious, even though she has called him toy from day one. That's just yeah. been her name for him. Because at first he was uh, he was Tylan's pet. He was Tylan's toy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, she's not going to to grace him with a name. He's not worthy of that. Remember, he's just a a buffoon. He she at this point <laughs> she does not understand what his skills are. She she is tied to him in some ways, and and I think this part of this is. Tuan still not wanting to, I don't know, maybe maybe not completely embracing her fate with him, her her being tied to him in any way, even though he's already made the the marriage proposal, if you would, and completed half of the ceremony, mm-hmm. unknowingly on his part, but that's what he did. 
you know, and, and she's intrigued by him. We we are beginning to see this relationship grow a little closer and a little bit closer. Yet at the same time, it's, it's if she wants to play these games with him uh, because she does not want to give him a name. She doesn't want to treat him as if he could ever be an equal. In fact, she doesn't really want to treat him as if he could be a person. Yeah. She would much rather treat him as a thing, as an object, something she can control. And I believe in her mind, whatever relationship comes from this, she might not be thinking about marriage yet. She might be. I don't know exactly what her thoughts are toward Matt in that regard. But whatever it is, it's it's all about how he benefits her about you know how she's going to mm-hmm. use this in her rule. All, yeah, all very strategic right. still, I think. And, you know, you said something about it seemed as, as Matt's Taverian powers were, were increasing. Of course, we know he's fated to marry the daughter of the Nine Moons. We know she is is now really the Empress, though she doesn't know it. Once yeah. news comes of the, the death of the Empress herself, Tuan will be the Empress. But the pattern has brought them together at the time that it did, for Matt to kidnap her, to take her away, for her to be willing to go along because of whatever omens, importance that that she, as Lucia, saw that she needed to follow Matt, mm-hmm. that saved her life. Had had that not happened, yeah. Matt would never have gotten to marry the daughter of the Nine Moons because the High Lady Suroth would have had her killed. I mean, that that's definitely yeah. in the works. The, and then, right, right. And we also would not have had the opportunity for anybody to build anything better out of the ruins of the Shantan right. Empire. It would have only been people gravitating towards that power vacuum and perpetuating some of the same awful practices that the Empire yes. already conducted. In my opinion, I mean, I don't see any other candidates yeah. that we know of who could have uh, helped turn around the Shantan yeah, Exactly. Yeah, culture. no one else. And in fact, the, the civil war back in the Shantan homelands is mm-hmm. it's that very thing. It's people vying for power in the same way they've always done it, moving in to, you know, to fill that vacuum, but, but not to change their society, just to gain control of it and, and to wrest control mm-hmm. away from other interested parties. It's not to better the empire, better the world or anything. And, and you're correct. This is the only shot really for that to happen anytime in the foreseeable future. So I, I, the pattern is, is, Saving Tuan's life by bringing she and Matt together and really hopefully making huge changes to the Sian Chan Empire in the future. I, I truly believe that was one of the things Jordan wanted to do was write a series about the changes yeah. in the in the empire. And I truly wish that could have happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, alas, we're left to speculate right now. But anyway, so Indeed. it's just fun that she is not going to give him a name. And when he you know, comes back and starts just calling her precious. Well, I'm just going to call you by a nickname. He does it almost as if it's a game. Yet when she refers to it as a game, he's all confused. It's, it's. Yeah. Well, I think she's seeing it like a stones right. game, not as like a, oh, this is cute. Let's you tease yes, each other. Yes, lovers yeah. game he, kind he, of thing. She's like, let's see who's going to win this game. Who's going right, to break first. Right. You exactly. Know? I didn't, I didn't equate it with the stones game, but what Matt is doing is sort of like, you know, third grade playground, you know, call each other yeah. names and, and we're going to have fun with it. And what she's doing is, like you said, playing a game of stones or in modern times. He's playing yeah. dice and she's literally playing oh, chess. Oh, yes. Here. I'm sorry to say chess. Yeah. <laughs> They're on different right. levels here. <laughs> yes. She's playing wizard well, chess know, and he's playing dice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of mm-hmm. Tuan and kind of circling back to how that relates to Matt's character traits, he... It, th- through the beginning of the chapter, he's stating outright that it, it doesn't state outright yet that he's buying the horse for Tuan. We don't know why he's going into town until he get once he starts haggling for the horse, we might have some idea that that's what mm. it's for. But it's clear once we learn that, that he's becoming even more smitten yes. with her than he was before. It, it's not just the cute stuff that you're supposed to do for just any girl. This is a huge gift, something that he knew would be within her interest, not just something generically feminine like right. flowers or jewelry Absolutely. or whatever. And she's really got him wrapped around her finger, and he doesn't seem to 
fully realized right. that yet. Uh, but I just thought it was very sweet and endearing that he goes to find the best possible horse. And it was really cool to see him trade for one. We know that this is his background. We have seen him evaluate horses in racing with Oliver and Abu Dhar and stuff like that. But we've never seen him actually in, in the process of inspecting one to buy it and haggling You're for right. the price. So he gets to really show off his knowledge for the reader. It brings together his competence at inspecting the horse with the negotiation techniques that we've seen him using elsewhere, like when he plays dumb. And he's so good at that playing dumb thing specifically that it's just really satisfying oh, to read overall. I yes, just love that was scene. a fun <laughs> scene for me. Uh, as you said, I hadn't really stopped to think. He has thought a lot about horse trading. He's equated a lot of other things to it. And as you said, he's talked about horses you know, in general or these specific in these races. But this is the first time we've got to see him at his craft, at what his diet taught him. Not what he's gained yeah. through these other memories, not what he's gained through Taveran superpowers. This is just Matram Cawthon as taught by Abel Cawthon. And I hadn't really thought of that, that that is one of the more endearing and fun scenes to read about Matt when he's just Matt and not super Matt, not Gollum mm. Matt, not, not anyone else. He's just <laughs> yeah, Matt. And, yeah. and it's a fun, fun scene. I did really enjoy that one. He also doesn't always have to play dumb. Uh, some things are still just totally lost on him as they are. He he doesn't, uh, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed sometimes. Now, there, he is a pretty sharp guy a lot of the time, but some things will just go completely over his head. And one of these things is Noel's true identity, oh, which Oliver doesn't get because he's a kid. That's fine. Matt... It's right there in his face. And the way that Noel keeps talking about, oh, yeah, he's he's just way too angry and sad to be talking about his cousin right, right. being an idiot. And he's laying it on so thick that she, he's like, oh, my uh, er, cousin yeah. uh, made some really bad choices in his life. And you can tell two ones never even heard of who this is. But once they explain it to her, she gets it. That is why she goes over to Noel. She's trying to, like, absolve him of all this guilt he's right. talking about, saying, you have a good heart, you know, and, and that is like out of character for her but it, it seemed like anyway but then i realized she is used to when she says something it yes. makes it so just like when she renamed Egion into mm -hmm. lylan and so i think she she is almost like administering a form of justice <laughs> well i don't know that it's quite that formal but she is used to when she speaks a thing it is so and that was very compassionate of her to try to do oh, that yes. for him at this point um, and just really cool. Like she is seeing through it and not blowing his cover or anything, just tries to absolve him of that guilt. Yeah. And in the midst of everything else that's going on, she could have absolutely not even deigned to speak to this commoner, but she did. And I thought that was interesting. And one of those signs that there is a germ of something more reformable in her, despite her Chan Chan upbringing, that gives me hope for a fourth age yes. future. I like how you pointed out, Matt, it was just, Blissful, blissfully ignorant of of that, yeah. Because it the 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 book the script really does put it right in our faces. I mean, just slaps us right upside the head <laughs> with the fact that there's more going on here. He has too much emotional investment for him to be talking about someone yeah. else. And my first time through the series, I completely missed it. I, oh yeah, <laughs> I was I was as blissfully ignorant as Matt. I had no clue, and so when I found out who Jane Farstrader and Noel really were, I was so blown away. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa stop! Look, let me go back now. Go back. Let me let me flip back a few pages. I missed something here. There's there's something I didn't get. Oh, you know, there's a lot of things I didn't get. And and you grew up around you know in in my household. You understand what I'm saying. There's a lot of things that I don't get. <laughs> You know, going through it this time where you know these big things and you start seeing these kind of huge clues. I'm like, oh, this is so this is so heartbreaking because mm, it, it's yeah. as if his downward spiral began with losing his wife. You know, he's off on his grand adventures. Mm -hmm. We don't really know, again, how he financed this or how it began. But but he definitely you could tell is a wandering soul. His his young wife dies. You know, he has nothing except regret. And then from that point on, Noel kind of starts a downward spiral that takes him in the company of dark friends and things things go very dark in his history. And mm -hmm. I'm assuming the, the real darkness came in after his book was published. Um, so that it just yeah. seems like it would fit in that timeline. I don't know that we have that spelled out specifically. 
but it seems like he had all these travels and grand adventures and he's he's great at telling these stories i have a feeling as as adventurous as his life was the stories grow in the telling so you know they're they're far more yeah. exciting than the real thing was but we do find out that just about everything he says about shara is yes. true yes yes <laughs> we don't find really the embellishment there in the places where our point of view characters are sure that's got to be right, made up right. but all those parts are actually right. true <laughs> there there are several things like that in the story where we know events to be true, yet the you know the other characters, the main characters, like well, there's just no way that can happen, and yeah. you know, they are just making that up completely. It's, it's one of those things that I love to to kind of go through this and and look for those little details and the things about Noel. It's rather heartbreaking because I find mm-hmm. myself liking Noel very much, and yeah. probably because there are so many similarities between he and Matt, and and I. Picture him in my mind is at this point being not a harmless old man because he's already shown he's ready to use his knives even in bad situations, but Mm. at the same time just a a lovable old man. Um, Mm -hmm. I I, I really picture him that way, and and there's some people in my life that I've known that that I picture Noel as being very much like some of these people, and Mm. uh, just this this lovable old man that yeah he may have a dark history but you can't help but like him. Yeah. Uh, and that's all I've got on this, this uh, chapter. How about you? I've just got the tiniest of tidbits mm-hmm. to check back in with how Matt is handling seeing ghosts. Oh, he yes. briefly, <laughs> he very briefly mentions it uh, in his thoughts. And it's really to say when he's realizing there's, you know, he's checking that the line is actually the people there and not one of the ghostly right, crowds. Yes when he's coming back to town and he is still very determined not to think about it. It's only extremely briefly. And it was such a passing mention that I had, I got it. I caught it in my second read through of this chapter when I was making notes on it, just like before. So that has not changed. Just, just very quick update there. And that was pretty much all I had about this chapter. Okay, cool. Cool. Well, we'll delve into chapter seven then called a cold medallion. Matt hustles Noel out to find the Aes Sedai, the two Suldam, and Egyanan, <clears throat> that is, Lyle and Shipless, and warn them all to hide that a large party of Sianchen soldiers were here in Jurador. At the front gate, three Sianchen soldiers tried to walk in and were confronted by the horse handlers at the entrance, who sent a warning whistle, then politely explained the prices for entrance to the show. It seemed that almost every man in the show arrived at the sound of that whistle. Matt decided the situation was far too volatile for him to remain there and still remain intact, so he quickly checked a few of his knives and began looking for a way out. Just then, a Sian Shan officer arrived and began questioning those men. They claimed that they had already paid. She looked around, saw Matt, who appeared to be a bystander, and asked him. He explained that he saw them try to enter without paying. The standard bearer, that was the officer's rank, sent the men back with proper punishments, then turned to face Luca and his crowd, and she asked them if any of them wanted, quote, a life of glory and adventure, end quote, by joining the Sianchan army. Everyone dispersed quickly. She turned and made the same offer to Matt, who disclaimed that, quote, I'd make a terrible soldier, standard bearer, end quote. That comment made her laugh. Matt respected that she had calmed the situation and dispersed the crowd quickly, The lady obviously had a sharp mind. Now that everything appeared back to normal, Matt ducked into the show and made his way to the Aes Sedai wagon, then quickly froze as he neared it, and his medallion went cold. What in the name of the light? They were flaming, channeling in that wagon. Matt burst in to see that Bethaman and Sita were wrapped up in flows of air, and Jolene was slapping Bethaman in the face repeatedly as the other Aes Sedai and Satel Anon watched. Matt grabbed Jolene's arm to stop her, and she quickly slapped him with the other hand. Here's a quote from Matt. Now that killed the goat. He sat down real quickly, pulled her across his lap, and began spanking her hard. Matt's medallion went ice cold. No, wait, it went colder than ice as he continued to spank her. The other ice that I watched as speechless and frozen as the two Suldom. Finally, Matt finished just as Satel Anon pushed her way over to him, and he let Jolene fall to the floor. Mistress Anon explained that since the Aes Sedai could not stop him with a power, he must possess a Tarangarial of some sort, 
She had heard of things like that from Cadsway and Malydrin, and she wanted to see it. The Aes Sedai immediately wanted to know how Mr. Sanan knew so much about the power and Aes Sedai business, and had she ever met Cadsway and Malydrin. But there wasn't time for that, because Jolene's warders, Blarick and Finn, had just arrived at the wagon, and Jolene ran and latched the door against them before Matt could get his knives out to defend himself. Jolene pointed a finger at Matt's face and started to upbraid him, but he stuck a finger in her face and startled her with a tirade of how they had done nothing except bully him ever since he had saved them from Xian Chan enslavement. They had ignored most every warning that he had given, but he was not going to put up with being hit. Here's a quote from him. You do that again, and I vow I'll pepper your hide twice as hard and twice as hot. My word on it. End of quote. Others then voiced that they would not stop him either. Matt thought that her warders might have something to say about that, but he'd worry about that later. Now that all of that was out of the way, Matt got them to explain what had happened. It seems that Bethamon had finally begun to channel. She didn't know the weave. None of them knew the weave, but it was throwing sparks everywhere. This was a first, though, because she finally admitting to being able to channel. Matt demanded that the Aes Sedai begin to teach her so that she would not die from channeling sickness. Well, that started a whole new round of arguments, but that gave Matt an opportunity to slip out of the wagon. Of course, he still had to face Blarick and Finn. When they demanded to know if he were involved, Matt replied, How could I have been? She's Aes Sedai. I suggest you ask her, then slipped away. That was a very uh, Aes Sedai answer there that Matt replied with at the end. <laughs> Yes, Crafty. it was not a lie, but it was not the entire truth either. Yeah. Um, this is one of those chapters, uh, the last half of it anyway, that makes me roll my eyes pretty hard. Anything that involves spanking in this series, I just, I just have a really hard time with. It seems very <laughs> silly, and it's like hard for me to take seriously that adults are actually spanking each other on the buttocks. It's just right. weird. Like there's, it's not like flogging on the back or anything. It's and it's like ubiquitous. It's in every culture. People just accept that that's the thing that happens. Yes. Um. So I just think between the swirling colors in the previous chapter and the spanking in this one, like Robert Jordan just needed to take a cold shower and edit these <laughs> afterwards. Like, chill out, dude. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, um, I, I have thought of that a time or two, how, you know, in our culture, spanking an adult is a very different thing from spanking yeah. a child. It yeah. you know, sometimes and it's has sexual connotations. Series. And <laughs> but but in Randland it does not. It right, seems to right. be almost as if well, if you're gonna be that childish, I'm gonna treat you like a child. And, mm-hmm. Matt, I mean, when Matt initiates this, I know it's skipping to the end of the chapter, but since I led with the, like, uh, ridiculousness of the spanking, (laughs) Matt, you know, he acts really impulsively. And he doesn't always do this, but this is one where he really let himself kind of run away with the situation where it reminds me of when he finds Egwene with the Omerlin stole and he like pulls her out of the chair and yes. rips the stole off her shoulders. And and this seems like what he was doing here because he did not wait to figure out at all what was going on. He wasn't thinking like, this is, I said, I business I need to stay out of or anything. He, um, and, and this time, he he does a very similar action as that time with Egwene, but this time it's not played like it's supposed to be funny. It's treated serious, even though physically very similar stuff is going on, at least with him, not with the situation that he finds, but the yes. way that he intervenes. Yes. And it also only makes sense that somebody like Jolene would slap a person who just grabs them. Like, she's in the middle of slapping anyway, and Matt right. grabs her, and she reflexively slaps whoever grabs her because he didn't give any kind of warning or figure out what was going on or do anything else. So it's weird that he's been trusting all these women to keep an eye on each other up until now. And he yet he doesn't at this point, he just runs in, treats them like kids. I get his like frustration with them because none of them have seemed appreciative in any way, but his strike first, ask questions later approach, you know, that's often so endearing with him uh, and, and an interesting part of his personality with when it comes to unexpected enemies or getting out of sticky situations here is not so cute and it's not played for laughs. So it's just, it's interesting. Matt is being his self and it's usually a comedic thing, like sl- slapstick type thing. And here it's like, 
a little more serious. I don't know. I'm just so confused by this scene, really. Like, why he did just run in. Why Jolene was actually slapping Bethaman. Like, I get that Bethaman was denying that she could see weaves but why was why was everybody just standing there watching her slap her it it, yeah the whole thing's just weird to me i don't quite get it yeah i didn't really understand the the face slapping of bethaman i guess to to kind of back up a a step or two here Mm -hmm. i'm playing forsaken's advocate again yeah with with matt's motivations Mm -hmm. i i believe he was so scared one because mm. you know he could he could tell their channeling if he can tell their oh, channel yeah, yeah. any channeler around could tell you know any female yeah. channeler so obviously were there any you know uh, suldam and and damane in that group of sian shen soldiers they still is a difficult word to say i know it's really soldiers. a tongue twister <laughs> but were there any there then they would be discovered very quickly and two ons writ or nothing is going to stop uh, these girls from being collared, yeah. so he's very angry because they're they're just flagrantly disregarding anything he said. He's told them to be careful. Again, he saved them from the collar. He has really risked his neck to to save them to get them this far. Every time they come to a city, he tells them stay in their wagon. They slip off. You know they're constantly doing things because. They know better than he does. Remember, they're Aes mm-hmm. Sedai. They've right. been trained. They they have authority that he doesn't have. They have authority that no one else has. They can do whatever they want to do, basically. You know, anything that is tower business or what they perceive as their business. And and he's, he's allowed this to build such a level that he just completely loses his cool. And I think what he intended to do was just grab her hand, stop them. Y'all stop channeling this Xian Chan right across the road over here. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't have a chance to say anything. He grabs her yeah. hand to put a stop to what they're doing, and suddenly he gets slapped. And that is, as he said, that killed the goat. This was mm-hmm. this was it. This is you know you you can bully me, and you have bullied me. You can ignore me like you've been ignoring me, but you are not going to hit me. Now, what he did, you know, to punish her again, it it, it just seems silly in some ways to, to spank yeah. a grown woman. But at the same time, it, when Mr. Anon started to step in and put a stop to it, of course, it's obvious that Jolene and even the other two, I said I had tried to do some weaves to stop what Matt was doing. When they realized they couldn't, was it Teslin that, that stopped Mr. Anon at first? <laughs> yeah. It's like, whoa, 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 let's see yeah. what's going on here. Let's, let's let this play <laughs> out. Because she has <laughs> had tension with Jolene since yes. way even before busting out of Abu Dhar. Right. Because they were really on, I don't even remember which was which, but like one of them was very pro Elida and the other one was more skeptical of her. And yes. the, yeah, there was already plenty of tension there. I think right. Teslin was just kind of enjoying the schadenfreude there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And... And as well, we've discussed before in the series how uh, Robert Jordan spent the first about three books of the series trying to build up the Aes Sedai mystique, their control, mm-hmm. their power, their all the things that they do, and spent the next 11 books basically destroying that a little bit at a time. Uh, yeah. First through the, the eyes of the wise one, who the wise ones discover the Aes Sedai are really not that impressive. Then the kin, you know, who just worshipped Aes Sedai, mm. discover that Aes Sedai are not very impressive. And, and we understand it uh, in studying this, that the the influence and the literal power of the White Tower has been waning for some time. Mm-hmm. The interference of the Black Aja has oh, you know, yeah. done a lot to derail that. And I think that was very intentional. And and just the influence of bad Omerlins in the past, and there have been many. And, of course, during this time, we have Elida, as, who is not a dark friend. She's just terrible at the job. Yeah. Has no business being there, but because of politics, she's there. So we see the influence, the negative influence that's had among Aes Sedai, and it continues to erode away their authority and their use of the power, as, as has been happening slowly for a thousand years at least. And this is is Matt opening their eyes to the fact that they're not all that they think they are, mm-hmm. at, at least with these three, with this group of them, because they thought they they knew better than Matt. They could bully Matt. They could do whatever. And this is him letting them know, you can't touch me. Yeah. Now, again, Blair and Finn can. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
And I'm really surprised that they don't end up figuring that out. You'd think she would be so humiliated that um, she would not let something like that slide. <laughs> right. But I think she was like as chastened as both the narrative and Matt intended her to be and yes. so didn't yes. end up retaliating. Yeah, in fact, she's the one that slammed the door in their faces so they couldn't get yeah. in the way. She didn't want to see bloodshed right then. But yeah. uh, I don't know, maybe she came to herself enough to realize, I guess I deserve that one. Yeah, which seems a strange thing for an Aes Sedai to admit. It's I'm just surprised. That, oh, yes. um, and I think part of it is mostly narrative convenience. Because yes, it's so hard to I imagine agree. that being uh, in character. <laughs> right. For her to I, just I, kind of accept I, that. Yes, I think that would create more tension. Uh, when a person is very upset, it normally takes a while to process that and get to the point where you can stop and say, okay, I learned from that bad experience. Yeah immediately you just have an angry reaction, a defensive reaction, a, you know, stop this or get back at that person reaction. Yeah, you'd think right away she'd be like, Blair can Finn, get him. Don't let him run away. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, in fact, they, well, in fact, their her first reaction was to stop him. That was yeah, use of the power. True. That's why his medallion yeah, grew yeah. so cold. But when that didn't work, maybe curiosity went out over it. Or like you said, more than likely, it's just, plot convenience <laughs> yeah she, but, i'm just still i could just see her being like waterboard him ask questions later <laughs> like <laughs> yes, yeah, i'll explain what happened just like get him in here <laughs> shut the door <laughs> yes yes uh, absolutely and i think that's also matt's to veer and look you know i didn't really think about that but him being mm. able to squeak at back out of this situation and still right. end up being the leader that he was trying to be here <laughs> yes yes <laughs> probably just his luck yeah and I, I imagine he did avoid those two for a while because they yeah. <laughs> they, they would have had to find out something eventually, or at least yeah. find out that he was involved. Because he seems you know, like from my memory, he's a bad liar too. You know, he thinks, oh, yes. oh they had no idea that I was discreetly <laughs> looking at their bosoms, and then yet, oh, for some reason, all the women are cutting their eyes at me, all mean. What's, yes, what's yes. happening? You know, <laughs> just like when he was back in Ebudar. Yes. So I could just imagine him being super weird around the warders. <laughs> right, right. The thinking he's playing it cool. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> every time they get near, he turns his friends. Hey, wait. Be cool, guys. Be cool. It's 5 0. Be cool. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, is our Matt. Yep. But, uh, uh, so, he uh, does a couple of really cool things in this chapter, though, that are pretty mm -hmm. courageous. Like, other than the the bizarre, like, reaction <laughs> and, 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 you know, uh, frustration built up and finally released in, here in this chapter with the spanking scene, we've got a couple of. There's one pretty kind act, I think, and it, one is where he keeps resisting calling Egion and Lylewin. He keeps thinking of it as foolishness. Mm. He's got no yes. regard for this convention. He's And he's not going to put up with it even on somebody else's behalf. Um, right. And he has no love for Egion. And <laughs> he does no, not like no, her, not but he has to identify with this renaming thing since... Tuan won't give him the dignity of using his name or even acknowledging that he has oh. one. And I wonder, I just wonder if this bodes well for him helping to make changes later in some Shan Chan culture by, yeah. you know, by being such a high status. And if he continues to just absolutely refuse to comply with some of these more authoritarian customs, that could bode well for people who have to live under Shan Chan rule wherever that is and whatever that's going to look like in the future. Yeah. Right. Because I could just it, see some things he's just never going to quite put up with. Right. Especially if he could learn to verbalize why. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm not going to do that, and here's why. And, mm. and basically explain the foolishness of it. You know, explain yeah. the emperor is not wearing clothes. I mean, all these things <laughs> you're saying are just not right. true. It doesn't work that way. I think that would really help. Mm -hmm. Well, I also think that just, you know, him being a public figure at some point in the future, all the subjects would see him just flouting these rules. And so the ability to uphold those customs wouldn't be as strong anymore. The yeah, I, the authority of them would be undermined. And I think his symbolic act of doing that would probably be more influential than him trying to reason. Because right. it, reasoning with Sean Chan doesn't seem to go anywhere because they have such a very different way of thinking about omens and everything. Right, right. I don't know. That, no, that's I, just sort of how I'm envisioning yeah. it. And I agree with you. I was just thinking, you know, after a while they would get to where they're thinking, well, that's just Matt. That's just Lord Matt. That's what mm, he does. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And he would have he to ha be have a, <laughs> the ability to say, you know, speak truth to power. Here's why we don't do that. Here's why you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. And and allow them to think about it and come to that conclusion that, well, 
you know, I see no ill effects from him doing it. And what he says makes sense. I think it takes both. You have to, mm. you have to take the stand and then you have to be able to explain why you're taking a stand. Because if you can't explain it, somebody else will explain it. And, mm, and it's not yeah. going to be favorable to you. So. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I like that. And it's not the only time he is really kind of speaking up for a truth. Right. He tells the truth to the standard bearer when she directly asks him whether the soldiers paid to get into the show. And yes. I think that's courageous of him because it seems very risky speaking out against Sean Chen's soldiers. Um, mm-hmm. He had no idea that this commander of theirs would be sympathetic you know, would be sympathetic to the show at all. You know, it, right, she, you right. would assume that she would just let them get away with whatever. But, you know, I wonder if he trusts their justice system enough by now. He's lived under it long enough to know that even the people in the higher classes fo- tend to follow their own laws. Or I wonder if he just took a gamble. I mean, it really does seem like a dice roll uh, because this could have gone very bad for him. He could have just stayed completely out of it. He could have said, I wasn't looking. <laughs> I just walked up. Right. <laughs> he could have said so many different things to not give the true answer there. But I think it's also funny that he said he would make her a bannerman when he was thinking about her and, yes. and what a great commander she is. But he doesn't seem to realize that the word standard bearer is its just a synonym for that. It, it yes. may mean the same thing rank wise. It could even be higher for all he knows. He he kept thinking it was strange how everybody was showing her so much deference, even though she didn't have a big plume on her helmet or something like some of the others. But I think she was probably way higher ranking than he realized. Right. Yeah. And, and it's a funny thing about Xian Chen rank. It, I know it's clearly defined or was clearly defined probably in Jordan's notes and in his mind. But to those those of us on the outside who are just getting tidbits of it, it's very confusing. Mm-hmm. Who ranks where? Yeah. As I said, Jordan he had to have had it all drawn out, written out, diagrammed because you know he he knew exactly where everyone fell within those those layers of rank. But even how the Death Watch guard of equal rank to a you know another soldier or gen, banner general or whatever is actually mm-hmm. a half step above them. You know, they, mm-hmm. they have all these mm-hmm. these minutia, you know, that, that changes everything uh, according to basically which branch of service you're in, now, which, you know, which makes sense. But to the people who are not involved with it, it's very confusing. So, yeah, I don't have a clue where Standard Bearer falls into any of that. But yeah. the Sian Chan soldiers there knew. And, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I do like how she handled that. Now, I think docking the men's pay and all was probably a bit much. It, yeah, it was, it was a little extreme. labor back at the camp should have been plenty. but <laughs> Yeah. But then at the same time, she did want to set, set an example. Mm. And then you know, when she turned to the crowd and, and kind of said it jokingly, but hey, do any of y'all want a life of, of adventure and glory? And you know, Come join the Xi'an Chen army, you know, square meals a day, and, you know, all these things, you know, and everybody just, you can see them cutting their eyes at each other, like, "Oh crap! I, I see y'all later. I got to, my wife's calling me," you know, <laughs> and everyone <laughs> yeah. turns to leave. And and Matt, you know, in his mind again, his private thoughts talks about, you know, that was really good because people just saw, you know, all the people standing around who thought there was about to be a riot or a fight of some sort. They they see this Xian Chen officer walk up. The three soldiers go back to what they were doing. The crowd disperses. Wow, she must be someone really important, but everything's mm-hmm. cool now, so let's go on in, you know. And it it didn't turn the people against the Xian Chen, uh, because you got to remember, she's still like most of the Xian Chen. They have the minds of conquerors who want to come in and assimilate this Altaran culture into their own. And you know, to them, mm. these are these are Xian Chen citizens, who are they? The people of Jurador. These these are people who've sworn the oaths. So. Yeah, she didn't want to set up anything in their minds that would make her look bad, make the Johnson soldiers look bad, make it look like it's the people against the military. You know, none of that. And so she she did it so masterfully that, you know, the the people they walk away, well, okay, well, yeah, you know, what looked like it was gonna be a bad situation turned out good. These people are actually pretty cool. And I think that's what she was aiming for there. And it was just a very shrewd way of handling it. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I'm still just proud of our boy Matt for speaking up for the truth, yes, I guess, because yes. <laughs> I w- would not have been courageous enough. <laughs> I would have just per- like looked behind me, you talking to me, you know, <laughs> or ducked out of sight. Like as soon as I saw her walking up, I, w- I would have been gone. <laughs> and I'm surprised he wasn't because he was looking for a yeah. way out, but I think it piqued his curiosity. 
to see how yeah, she handled probably. things because I mean Matt has this soldier mind. He has this militaristic way of thinking, and it was as if okay, I'm, I'm going to take notes here. I'm going to see what she does. Mm-hmm. And curiosity won out over his his desire to run. So yeah, it's just this one. It's a very small moment in this huge story, and you know, two years from now we won't remember that it happened <laughs> <laughs> because there's so many things that happen in the story. Yet at the same time, it, it's a pretty cool one. And in my mind, I kept wanting for her character to come up again some other time. Doesn't she? I, I don't know. I don't know. Oh. You know, I keep equating her with. Um, I think is is it Tylee that is. A oh, you know, that's who I thought she was. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think she comes up again. Uh, yeah, Because that's who I thought it yeah, was. Yeah, that worked yeah. with Perrin later on in the story. But the, mm, the geography yeah. is too far apart. And, and again, this one's a standard bearer, not a banner general. So, uh, or, or maybe Ty Lee is not a banner general. But I, I in my mind, I kept wanting to equate these two. I think she is, yeah. But, you know, I just, I, I couldn't, I, I could never make the logistics work. Um, but mm. it just, just this scene made me like the standard bearer anyway. I, I wanted her to come out in the story yeah. and she may, and I'm sure there's, you know, if she does, there's some listener out there who's you know, screaming at their computer that. Oh, I <laughs> hope so. We'd love to hear from oh, you yes. before we get there in our respective rooms. Right. Please yes. let us know. Please, please do. We, we do. <laughs> just turn your rage into a tweet or an email and let us know right yes. away. <laughs> yes. Thank you for that, LaJar, because we, we do love hearing from you listeners. And sometimes I know it's infrequent because you're busy and, and, and most of the time you're probably, you know, making fun of the male half of this, uh, this co-host team anyway. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, we do love hearing from you. It, it it helps us to improve our show. It helps us to know you're out there listening because we're going to keep doing this anyway. But but still, we, we just enjoy hearing back from you. The, the feedback really helps. And those were about all my notes on this chapter. Did you have anything else? Um, no. Well, I hope everyone will join us next time as we go through episode 30 where we cover The Knife of Dreams, chapters 8 and 9. Subscribe to Wheel of Mind on Podbean, Stitcher, Google Play, and that one is going away, I think, at the end of this month, so stay tuned as to what will replace it. Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, and that last one is under the name Lajara Dane, L-A-J-A-R-A-D-A-Y-N-E, to get notified when a new episode drops every Wednesday. Leave us feedback, as I was just saying, by rating and reviewing on your podcast listening platform, or contact us through email at lajaradane at gmail.com, or on Twitter at mind underscore wheel, or you can reach me at Lajara Sedai, S-E-D-A-I, on Twitter. We also have a new way that you could support the show to help us with the cost of maintaining the show, and you can find that at patreon.com slash wheel of mind. We only have a single tier right now of $3 per month, so for only $3 per month, you could contribute to the show. This is not the ending, but it is an ending to the turning of the wheel of mind. That's all, folks.